Hello, I'm Kelvin and I'm from Malaysia. Does that sound familiar to you? So every time when we introduce ourselves to, when it especially comes to an international community, we kind of just say this, like, my name is this. I'm, I come from this part of the world. But have we ever thought or have we ever, ever come to a realization that most of these times we're just taking our nationality for granted? So you have a passport, right? So when you walk into an airport, you're about to check into a flight. You're about to board the plane. So what would the staff in the airline company ask for? Your passport. And you would just, you know, take it, take it out from your, from your pockets and just show it. It's a privilege. When you have a kid who's about to enter school, elementary school, what do, you, what, what do the school administration want? A birth certificate, I'm sure. And that's a privilege. I work with stateless people in Malaysia. And today, there's an estimated 12 million people who are stateless who have no country or places in the world that they can belong to. In this case, they, are, they have no uh, legal bonds with a state in the world. And therefore, they're stateless. Stateless people might sound like refugees, but they are really different. So let me give you an example. Um, without a legal identity that, you, that, that bonds you to a certain country in the world, you will not be entitled to, I mean, most of the time, you're not entitled to certain privileges or fundamental ac access to, to fundamental rights, like education, like healthcare. And Stateless children, which comprise of 55% of the total stateless populations in the world, are vulnerable to exploitation, abuses, and some of the most inhumane things that we can't possibly imagine. So I work with the Rohingya community, and these people are stateless refugees. So what happened is in 1982, um, a law was passed in the Burmese government which renders them stateless. We call this the nationality law of 1982. And they have been stateless for three decades, more than three decades. So they started fleeing the country of Burma. And they dropped by at the various countries in ASEAN and, and as well as Bangladesh and India. And in Malaysia, we have about 80,000 Rohingya refugees right now. And we have a saying with these refugees when we describe them, or when we interview them, they always mention to us. So when we ask this question in interviews, we ask, what do you normally do? So they say, we just sit all day. So we, we start realizing that there's a huge degree of inactivity within the community of these refugees, which I would like to call underutilization. We underutilize these th people, and therefore we just bury their immense potential under the ground. We think of them as victims, which is wrong. They are not victims. Because when we think of them as victims, we design their life in a sense that they always stand on the receiving end of the society. And that kills away potentials. That just excludes people. And that just really is really dehumanizing. So part of the projects that we do, which is called a 100 village project in Malaysia, is that we use farming and permaculture as a mean to propagate and, and to develop community resilience in a community. So by farming their own food, they can also develop their economic um, um, activities in terms of selling extra sur surplus to the market, local markets. In this case, you might not even imagine that they could be even better um, climate change fighters in, in the world. Because with these methods of helping them um, develop the skills that they need, um, we could really see the change where these people move from inactivity, inactiveness, to empowerment. So over the past few months, we have seen some changes. And we have worked with local um, stakeholders. And uh, these people are amazing.
like not just authorities and, and, and local people, but we have a huge amount of backpackers from all around Europe and even in a Asia and America. And we use lots of appreciative inquiry-based approach to tell the world what we do. And the website is 100village.org if you're interested to look into what we do. The 100 Village project has um, three underlying components, uh, the way that we deliver our solution. So number one is actually sustainable shelter solution, where we focus on building an earthship inspired um, building structure that could accommodate at least uh, one family for now, because we're prototyping right now in Malaysia. And if you know about Earthship, uh, you would be very familiar with these things that I'm about to say. So it's going to feature uh, sustainable solutions such as like waste management, um, energy solutions that are sustainable because we are, uh, we are planning to use solar. And uh, if not, then um, we will be going for biomass as well, which will take into account the needs of the community in terms of delivering energy solutions. And then we'll be incorporating other solutions such as uh, temperature regulation because we come from the tropics, it's really hot there. And um, the second component of our solution is um, farming. And it's very permaculture based because we don't have a lot of land to do what we want to do. And then the third component is very much about community empowerment. So our principle is very much about including the community in our work and to include them in co-designing and co-creating um, solutions and when it, when it comes to um, um, meetings and strategizing, we include them all the time in validating some of our approaches and in reviewing some of the problems that we face and to move towards solutions. And so that's, that's the, those are the three components of our uh, project. Being in Wisely program, uh, I've learned that the way that we deal with communities is not just about dealing with the negative as aspects of it but it's really much about finding the positive sides of it because with that, it en enables us to um, design our approaches and our, our methods more uh, constructively. And so I would like to just end this um, video with uh, a message. Um, in the refugee community that I work with, I met Abdullah and he's 20 years old. So he left his home after violence broke out in the village in Arakan in Myanmar. So he fled, left his parents behind, brought his two siblings who died in the forest as he fled and went to the harbor and he had to beg the human traffickers to traffic him. He had nowhere to go and so he just boarded the boat. Four months without access to sanitation and clean water and food and vulnerable to abuse, he finally reached Malaysia and was detained immediately in an immigration camp for two years. And that two years, he did nothing. He, he just, the only thing that he did is breathe and, and trying to survive and struggle through the worst possibilities of, of life. He was abused, he was exploited. And when he came out of it, he had stage four leukemia. And so I met him and Abdullah, to me, he's a hero, surviving on his own, like this is not easy. And then when he approached us, and when we started um, integrating him into the community that we work with, after he was released from the camp, and he told me that he's a farmer, and he would like some seeds. He would like to have a farm. And that just shows how hopeful it is, instead of the conventional way of us thinking that these refugees have nowhere to go and they're just stuck in the legal limbo. But Abdullah will get his seeds eventually and he will plant and he will farm and he will, he will inspire the others to do so. This is what we are about. It's about community resilience. It's about how we include these refugees and these stateless persons into the line of work that we do. And I urge that you think the same way as well, to not look at these people as victims, not, but these people have complete potentials, just like any one of us, to stand on the giving side of society. Thank you.